and here we go. Today, we've got another episode of the INFJ Musician That's the Libra and Stuff podcast. And uh, today's episode is actually going to be talking about why I went from rap music to rock music uh, and why this was a change I've made, uh, why this was a change I made in my career, despite actually getting some momentum with rap and um, why I just decided that it wasn't necessarily the path that I wanted to take anymore. Uh, so we're going to get into that. But before we do, if you look to the uh, over my shoulder here, you'll see a little poster of Easy e Today is his birthday, um, September 7th. It's also Buddy Holly's birthday. And um, I think that's actually a good place to to sort of start, not really start, but to to, to make a little point of the fact that uh, those two guys probably, you know, as you'll see as I get more into this story, Buddy Holly and Easy e both born on the same day, just so happened to have a massive influence on, you know, what I like and what I sort of pursued in terms of music uh, and advancing in it. And my whole desire to become a musician is stemmed by those two people. And I, and I just find it, uh, I didn't know this uh, back then, but I recently found out that they had the same birthday and it just sort of struck me as interesting at the very least that these two people that were so impactful in my life both had a September 7th birthday. So anyway, I just thought I'd mention that. Uh, rest in peace, Easy e uh, and uh, thank you. Um, so basically, as I said in the last one, um, my life has been built around music. Uh, rap was sort of the first music I ever tried to pursue. But um, so I should take you back. Like I said in the last time, Sum 41 is a huge influence of mine. Uh, Linkin Park was at first, but it was really Sum 41 that really made me uh, get into to punk music like that. Um, initially, I had I'd played like Tony Hawk, and like I said, I I really started getting an affinity for punk music and the way the message it had and their lyrics, and then like you know the nice little feel to the songs, um, and that sort of drove my interest at that point. This would have been when I was like. Um, how old would I have been? Maybe fifth grade, uh, sixth grade, however old you are in that. Um, I didn't get held back or anything. So just whatever normal age you would perceive there. And at that point, I really started getting into that music. But then, like I said last time, I made this shift. Uh, eventually, uh, my father went to jail. And then I made the shift to hip hop, you know, because it spoke to me more at that time. So we went through all that. Uh, obviously the whole hot beats thing and and come around 2010 so i was still a tone the priest a tone the priest is my rap moniker if you're listening to this by some chance you know you don't know about a tone the priest that is my rap stage name that i've uh put out like four albums on um and uh so i was still a tone the priest um and I was going through like a little tumultuous time in terms of like relationship stuff. It was probably my first real official, what I thought was like a real relationship um, with this girl. I'll call her Leah, uh, this girl, Leah. So me and her had this relationship and it was very tumultuous, very like abusive and manipulative and all of these things. Um, and uh, we would take breaks every so often just because we would have, you know, a lot of, uh, issues with trust and things like that um and one break in particular i went to my mom's house and i was sort of helping her move and clean out because she was going through all this drama with my childhood home uh, which she would eventually you know give up uh you know for some stuff uh not for some stuff she didn't get anything for it but i mean like drama she gave it up for drama and I, we were going there and i sort of remember that she had always had these guitars um that she would have because she had this hard rock collection. She her thing was to like to travel from place to place to all the hard rocks around the world and collect all the glasses um, that had the names of the places on them. Um, so she had these guitars in front of the cases just to make it look all cool, you know, hard rock. And um, it was actually so before I ever got into hip hop, the first conception I ever had of doing music on any level, um, you know, besides just having a little keyboard and 
performing for my um i would call my mom and my sister or something and be like oh listen i can play this song or i can play ode to joy or i can play i can you know whatever some stupid stuff just to to perform uh because i felt like I, I had accomplished something right i just wanted to show it off uh but my first real conception of ever doing music in any kind of way was to have a band a band that would have been called stigma that was the first name i don't know i think i guess i think i use the word stigma just because uh you know of stereotypes i think without even knowing that i was always very sensitive of stereotypes because I'm such a person that never really fit in with anybody. So for me to be stig have a stigma about me, I wanted to like break that conception. Um, you know what I mean? You know what I mean? So I was going by, uh, my little moniker was Rico Frost at the time. And the band name was Stigma. So whatever, fast forward. So at this point, 2010 20, through 2012, I'm still Atone the Priest, but I found this guitar at my mom's house. And, you know, and I just my friend justin so justin was instrumental in this as well uh justin you know it, she had two guitars and he was like oh let's take the guitars and uh you know come and take them to the crib and, and try to jam and you know just have some jam sessions so i was like okay that's cool um i sort of already had an inkling like i i think i can almost recall m my desire was to go there and get the guitar for some reason um so go and pick up the guitar, bring it home. Um, this is one of the periods, I think, so during this tumultuous relationship, I had actually, uh, in my car, I like had all these CDs, and I think I had come back across uh, the Does It Look Infected CD by Sum 41, um, because I was just going through all my old CDs, because um, all I was listening to in hip hop that time at that time was like, A Mafia, I think Al Gator might have came up with a new uh, mixtape. These are rappers uh, that I was really into at the time. But I was sort of waning on it because I was like, I think, A, like the stuff that I was hearing at the, the studio was becoming very formulaic and people were, you know, there was no more underground anymore, it didn't seem. I feel like people were chasing this commercial sound. Um, and at that same break, I feel like Drake, uh, rapper Drake, was starting to really make head in the game. And and I think me and Drake have a, you know, sort of like a, uh, I would say that maybe there's, we have similarities in terms of maybe our characteristics uh, because we're both October 22nd. I think he's 23rd. We're right there. So, I mean, I see, I see some similarities, I guess, between – what would be a personality trait? I even met Drake one time. He was actually a really nice guy. Uh, he was at the studio while Lil Wayne was there. Um, and he had rented out the ski lodge, which was the first room in the studio. And uh, he had his guy, his producer, and then maybe one other guy there. So I don't think, like, all the stories about him interning at Hot Beats, like he said that in one, he's like, I was up at Hot Beats, dead and giving dap, serving niggas drinks, but I didn't get to rap. To me, as far as I saw, that wasn't true. Maybe there was something going on in the session and he maybe he made Lil Wayne T or something, but I didn't see that. From what I saw, he was independently doing his own thing uh, from the jump. And then him being there was the conduit to those two sort of meeting. Or maybe Wayne invited him. I don't know the whole story. But anyway, I felt like Drake sort of disenfranchised me with hip hop a little bit because I felt like... I don't know. It was just almost like, I can't put it all on Drake. I just can't put it all on Drake, but it was everything that was all compounding. I sort of found Drake corny and I felt like Lil Wayne was almost like passing the torch to Drake and Nikki. And then he was sort of becoming like them too. So he was losing his authenticity. Then everybody else just started sort of singing. Kanye came out with his little singing album hip hop just became in a place where everybody was sort of trying to make this like a uh, trap soul kind of thing, I guess. I don't I wouldn't even call it that. That's, that's like more like trap disco. I think soul is too generous, you know, and, and that's what would sort of uh, become what is today where like your female rappers are your more like thorough MCs and your dudes all pretty much sing. So anyway, that I'm jumping ahead of myself. So anyway, I picked up the guitar and I started listening to this Sum 41 CD again. 
and it just started clicking with me, man. Like the things I was feeling then were so much more in lockstep with the vibes I was getting off those rock records than anything I was feeling in hip hop. Because I was feeling vulnerable. I wasn't confident as I, you know, the confidence that I felt from the hip hop records at that point felt contrived because I guess I had never really been that vulnerable before or been in a state where uh, someone had made me feel someone outside of myself had made me feel less or, you know what I mean? I'd be like, Oh, why does she not want uh blah, blah, blah. Am I not good enough? Blah, blah, that kind of thing, you know? And I think the rock music sort of empowered me right in a way, you know, so I, comfort with who I am and not trying to be some image or live up to some fake image of a you know all this money driven bravado stuff that just wasn't my position in life and maybe wasn't close and it was I mean I, at that time I, I always thought riches would be right around the corner but uh, it wasn't close right so so yeah, I just grabbed it, I shifted over and then I started really getting back into like, okay, what was Sum 41 doing? I listened to their new stuff. And I just saw them progressing and progressing. So the first thing I did, I listened to their Chuck album and I think it was either No Reason or We're All to Blame. And then, excuse me, it was either No Reason or We're All to Blame on their Chuck album. So I listened to that album and I, I, I was inspired to write the song called No Waiting. Um, obviously this time I, I sort of sucked on guitar. So let me predate, so let go back a little bit. Uh, Justin, when we brought the guitars home, he would be playing them a lot more because obviously I didn't have any comfort with the guitar. I didn't really know where to start or what to do. You know, so he showed me how to play power chords. Um, and I pretty much got that pretty quick. And I was like, damn, this shit hurts my fingers. So... <laughs> I played some power chords. The next thing I did was um, I started looking up tablature, right? Uh, so I looked up a couple Green Day songs. Um, I think it was Welcome to Paradise. I looked up the Hell song by Sum 41. And I just sort of tried to sit there and figure out these songs to myself. Um, I was still living with, with Leah at the time. I was living with Justin. And we were all sort of co opt in this place. Um, but I forget where Justin was, but I have a distinct memory of learning to play. I had decided to go sleep in the other room from the, the chick and I was just learning, sitting there on my little mat bed, learning to play the hell song. That's like a memory I have. So the timeline sort of gets messed, messed up. Well, anyway, so with my limited skills on the guitar and pretty much just knowing how to play power chords. And the reason, the only reason I brought up that whole story is because now that I'm thinking back to when I first... When I took the, the 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 California guitar, my California Strat copy uh, guitar, it's somewhere around here. Where's that guitar? At? I'll show you. all oh, It's in the other room. Maybe one day I'll show. You. I, don't, I don't feel like it. I don't feel like getting it right now. So um, uh, when I plugged that, in, when I went into the studio, straight into the Avalon, uh, the preamp at Hot Beats in the Ski Lodge, and then I don't even think I was doing. I might've been doing like a two finger power chord, right? Because I think all Justin had taught me was a two finger power chord, like a two chord one and not like the third extension where you bring the other finger. Uh, so I was just doing my, and it went doom, 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 doom. And then I just came up with that little riff. And then, um, so it was that song, uh, no reason I believe. And then it was, uh, and then the bass line sort of just fit into that, right? And then I came up with the whole little video because I was seeing, um, what's the name of that Green, View, Green Day song? Long View. I sort of based the video off that. So I was just sort of like digging in the crates of like all these like early 90s. I need to turn on the fan. It's getting hot in here. So yeah, just I sort of started digging in the crates of all these early '90s um, uh, rock songs and punk rock songs that I, I'd always sort of knew, but never really got into. Right, like I knew of Green Day and all their commercial songs. And I knew uh, like The Offspring and all these other things. But Justin was an adamant fan of punk rock, right? And and I loved punk rock. That was like one of the first musics. Like I like I said, 
that I loved on my own. Um, so he started introducing me to all these these bands like um, No Use For A Name, uh, The Offspring's first album, No Effects, uh, Black Flag, Minor Threat, uh, Bad Brains, Bad Wayne's, uh, just all these bands. Seven Seconds. That was one like one of the off kilter ones that he introduced me to. That I'm glad he did. Um, uh, who else am I missing out? And then all, all these all cool bands. And then just from like sort of like clicking on everything on YouTube, I came across Nirvana. And I was like, of course, I'd already heard of Nirvana. Um, like I said, I'm, I was always a fan of the Morose and like sort of like a twisted thing. So I had known that Kurt Cobain was the musician that had killed himself and blown his brains out. But I had no idea about the impact that, that they had on culture and, and music in general. So I saw that uh, Smells Like Teen Spirit, you know, when YouTube always like recommends stuff for you. And I saw that video and I was like, wow, that's pretty freaking cool. So then I saw In Bloom. I'm like, oh, wow, this is even cooler. Like this guy, he's funny, blah, blah, blah. And he, uh, he has a little image and uh, he's goofy and all that kind of stuff. And then he, the music just sounds good. It's like, it's an attitude, you know? And then I love music that conveys attitude more than anything else, because I love stories, right? And when I listen to music, I listen to lyrics and your lyrics don't have to be complex or anything, but I feel like a good song tells some type of story or gives you some type of narrative or piece of information. Um, and it leaves you with some type of resolution, right? And it was almost weird because Nirvana songs definitely don't do the resolution thing, but what they do is they put you in a thought loop, right? Cause the way that Kurt, I immediately realized that the way Kurt wrote was very similar to the way I thought, right? It was a lot of irony, like a lot of like questioning questions, right? Um, and I had sort of been on that kind of tip because that, uh, I had, I had recently, I like, had been reading the Bible, right? And I like read the Bible front to back, just like it was a book. I wanted to like take the feelings away and just sort of read it like it was a book. And the main thing, my main lesson that I took from the Bible was that it's full of contradictions and not as a negative thing, but because that is like a lesson that people need to learn about life that even God doesn't necessarily always give the best advice, right? Or not, maybe not, not to say the best advice, but Sometimes God does things that you don't agree with, right? And he might do one thing one time and then for the same exact situation, do something else, right? And then it's not your duty to decide that. Well, anyway, Kurt's writing really resonated with me in that way. And then uh, also the fact that it resonated with all the depression that I had always had. Like uh, I was recently looking through like my old crates and I came across like a, an agenda from fifth grade. And in fifth grade, I wrote something, life is depressing or some shit like that. And I looked at that and I was like, wow, like that thing is deep. Then I might not have known what it meant, but obviously now I do. And it's true, like that's been a sweeping uh, theme for a very long time in my life for whatever reason. So anyway, Kurt Cobain just really resonated with me. And at that time, it resonated with me so much more than anything any rapper was saying. I just felt like rap had became had become so derivative and and another thing that like so there's two factors to it right there's two things I can say my mind at the time was saying that okay well it it became I think like with hip hop the more words you say the less you will soon have to say right because you say so much to get a message across and you say so much to fill those beats and create a nice little rhyme scheme that sometimes you like play yourself out a little bit because you're trying to say too much to actually say a little, right? But then rock to me became more of the like, okay, well, I can say less, maybe use some metaphor, maybe use some cute language and have a much more complete message. And then you don't have to stretch yourself mentally so hard right um at least that's how i, ra I rationalized it at the time right and i was like okay well this is 
it's not that it's easier, but it's a different challenge. And I was up for a different challenge because I was sort of tired of uh, just saying so much. And then not only that, but people weren't listening like that. It's not like the music was catching on. Um, so at any rate, so that that's how my mind shifted. And then the second aspect of that is that, you know, like I, I've said, my mind works in melodies a lot of times. So when moments happen in life, my mind will communicate them as a song or melody, maybe as like a defense mechanism in a way to protect my ego or something like that. But that's just what happens. So a thought will come to me, and it'll make me feel a certain way. And then out of it will come songs. Well, before that point, it was rap lyrics, right? Before that point, it was um, hooks for rap songs and in 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 a more urban sounding ideas but after that point it became more poetic metaphorical emotional and melody it just became melodies because i was listening to nirvana man and i was listening to all these rock groups so i started wanting to emulate that more and then from that came october sky so October Sky. So well, first of all, so not waiting. Obviously, there's two songs uh, on the project. I was doing a, so a project called The Fi King, and it was one of my. If you ever check out The Fi King, to me, that's probably my best rap album um, because there's concepts and there's just good songs. My production is pretty good on that, and <clears throat> I always let me take some water. that album even got like four and a half stars from some reviewer it should have been five but he didn't like the king song for some reason well anyway there was a couple songs on there where i was sort of experimenting with the guitar the rock um the not waiting song is actually the the most rock but all those songs had rap on them right and i was saying not waiting for your ignorance so that was pretty rock but then lose your mind wasn't even initially a rock song i just adapted that one um now that I've listened back to that, I actually really like the hip hop version too of Lose Your Mind. Um, My Angels obviously was also, it was a rock sounding rap beat, but I had to adapt that one as well because I didn't want to necessarily use too many of this other producer's beats. Um, Pain, uh, like that's just a, a rap song with uh, some guitar licks in there. And it's pretty cool sounding, but you know, it's not that. Um, so the fight came was pretty much a rap album, but I was making a shift. There was a shift coming in. And October Sky was that pivot to where I really was trying to channel my like Lincoln Park. I don't know if I was consciously trying to do that, but so after I found Nirvana, I started like um coming across like more garage sounding, like more obscure rock records. Um from that era right so I, I i came across things like uh uh what was that plastic thunder i think i feel the sound of thunder and then the song like we're going to the moon we're leaving so soon and then uh the killing joke came across some bands like that um the weight the song the weight from them then I just, it was actually these these mixtapes that I made because I found all these cool songs, like 60s, 70s songs, some 80s songs, just a lot of really obscure, cool, like garage rock. I guess they didn't call it alternative back then, but some of it was psych rock, some of it was hard rock, just like obscure numbers. And I put them on these mixtapes along with like Oasis, Nirvana, and then all these punk songs that I was talking about earlier. Uh, from Rancid and, I, and these were the things that because I guess my aux cord was dead or something I don't know what was wrong or what was going on then because these songs were on my iPod as well but it was these CDs that sort of shaped what became of um, the o October Sky and like the uh, even the um, the synth punk I love synth punk uh, and just a lot of these themes and a lot of this punk rock kind of thing so October Sky was just a, a DIY rock project, right? With program drums. So I was still using program drums at that point. And um, so one thing I should note, like when I made October Sky, so my um, 
around this time, around 2012, a lot of the hip hop stuff I had done, it also started to get uh, some recognition. It got some MTV. So I just say that it got on MTV and things like that. So I say that just to let you know that I was actually pretty good at mixing hip hop records. But when it came to rock, I was completely out of my element in terms of like putting all the instruments together and uh, making that blend and maybe staying in key sometimes with the different instruments and uh, different aspects like that. So I put that album together sort of haphazardly. A lot of it sounds pretty crazy, right? To me, it still sounds good. Like I can listen to it, especially in a car with some, you know, surround speakers. But I can see, you know, how the average listener would be like, yo, this sounds terrible. But anyway, it's a, so I came up with that album and I recorded all that. And like I said, at this point, I was still a tone the priest. So in my mind, um, I was going to just adapt the rap thing into that. But with me getting a little bit of success on some of my older records, I started to see that a lot of people would, with the exposure I was getting, a lot of people would be like, yo, a tone the priest, you know, we love your music, but a tone the priest is sort of throwing us off in terms of, um, what we're listening to when, before we click on it. Right. It, I forget what the, what the word, not a misnomer, um, something like that. Whereas like it, it wasn't a good indication of what they were going to get when they clicked on it. Right. But then I, like I said, what is a tone, the priest, a good indication of it's like the only song that really embodies a tone, the priest is symbol and sinful off the address EP. But anyway, so, um, so yeah, it was still Atone the Priest and I, I had all this guitar stuff, all these really cool and creative songs, all these dope ideas that I built up. Um, some of them had the quiet to loud aspect like the Pixies or Nirvana. Some of it was just really artsy. Some of it was like Prince inspired. Some of it was synth punk inspired. It's way too many ideas and concepts. And then there was a crossroads, right? Um, it was either promote the Fi King album or promote October Sky because I had a little money and I was going to push the record and really go hard in the media with one of these albums. Um, so I submitted October Sky and that was a mistake, right? It was, it was to my peril. Um, the, the person who was in charge of the little promotion thing, he was like, you know, you're a genius, bro, but this sounds terrible. <laughs> That was pretty much like that summed up what he was saying. It's like, and I really took offense to that, right? And I sort of like cursed the dude out. You know, hindsight, if I would have just submitted the Fi King, it probably would have, you know, maybe caught on a little bit more. And I'm not saying I would have been famous now or anything, but I think that album deserved a lot more uh, attention uh, in terms of like, like on a massive scale than October Sky ever really would. Like October Sky was like my Operation Ivy project. Like, like you know what I mean? That's like a cult following thing. But my ego was ready to be known as a real musician, right? I almost at that point started to look down on rap. Like I wanted to be known as a guy who crafted these great songs with my guitar and uh, sung these 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 comp these cool hooks and these you know uh, thoughtful rap lyrics in between the breaks and I just I was after this validation right when I should have just humbled myself and went with the rap project right but anyway that was the pivot right to where I realized that this was going in a different direction um, so I started thinking as I was making more songs. Um, I started thinking, what do I want to brand this as? And I was thinking Tone Priest. That was the initial name I was going to use before I just went with Marco Restrepo, my actual name. Um, I still I still like that name, Tone Priest. Like, it's sort of like the Priest of Tone. You know what I mean? But, um, so yeah, so October Sky got uh, shat on by that guy. Some other reviewers sort of shat on it. But I mean, I took the positive that they said I was a genius and the ideas were there, right? So it's just like, okay, under in the right context, this would have been really good. But anyway, so 
the the shift in the name actually came. So I was still a tone the priest. Uh, the shift in the name came when I was about to do my next project. It was going to be called the Promised Land, right? Um, and I actually wanted to bring Sean, uh, the rapper friend from One Up, uh, in on this project. So I sent him some of the beats. He wasn't feeling that shit at all. So that sort of like made me realize, okay, this journey is a personal journey, right? Uh, you know, I realized like I have to make a shift, right? Because I'm not feeling the rap shit anymore, but I can't bring that part of me with me all the way because there's a, there's a disconnect, right? Um, and and like I said, I, the promised land still, whenever it comes out, it's still going to be as it was with the rap lyrics in it. And I think that it still stands that that way and it'll be good. But I realized that I had to own that part of me with a different name. Like this stuff had to go in a different category. Um, and then at the same time, so the promised land was preceded by a time when I discovered, so I was watching Beatles documentaries. I, I knew who the, of course I knew who the Beatles was. Everybody in the world knows who the Beatles are. But like I said about Nirvana early, I did I didn't know the cultural impact. I didn't know how much they had influenced I realized until I started listening to it. So coincidentally enough, I was listening to, or I was watching some Beatles documentary just to like sort of see about them. And I saw uh, them talk about how much they admired Buddy Holly. So at that point, you would think it's like, okay, well, I got really into the Beatles, but no, I actually didn't get into the Beatles at that point. I actually started getting really into Buddy Holly. Um, and I, and I went and I got his, um, his greatest hits album. And there was just a quality about that music that Buddy Holly did. And, and of course, like I said, I, I'm, I'm very morose. So when people die, I tend to, um, uh, just have more interest in it because I sympathize with people who, uh, who tragedy surrounds. Right. And Buddy Holly was obviously a big tragedy. So I started listening to his music and I was like, wow, this guy was really talented to only be 24 and to output all that music, that high quality of music that I could still listen to then, uh, 50, 60 years later. And, um, still be like wow this is really speaking to me that said something to me right and then uh next just being the student of the game i am i started listening to the beatles and that introduced me after loving buddy holly so much i wanted to see what that begot and the beatles starting to dig through their albums i literally started from the first album i watched the movies too I think I watched the movies actually before I got into Buddy Holly. So that's sort of how that happened. Uh, so I listened to their first album and I was like, wow, this is pretty good. And then I listened to the next album and I was like, wow, this is pretty good. So I started like burning their albums onto CDs and then I would put it in my car and I just started listening to the Beatles religiously. I'm like, wow, these guys are, you know, because I think, I always looked at singing as sort of like a not me thing, right? I was always sort of good at it, right? Especially when I was younger. But as I got older and started developing what I thought was cool and what wasn't, um, singing to me was one of those things I thought wasn't cool because a lot of it was so like, like all that sort of tender and soft kind of stuff. But then I heard the Beatles, and obviously Nirvana is that way too, but Nirvana that's obviously like just like hard rock punk type stuff where, you know, it's not about the singing to me, punk rock is more like hip hop uh, where it's not really about the singing. It's about the message. Right. So you hear that and, and it's easy to, it's easy for a person who doesn't really like pretty singing to get into that. Because like I said, it's all about the, the attitude and the, the message. Right. But then you hear the Beatles and it's just like, I heard like just like regular guys. Right who weren't like over uh, over like sensual, over like sexual, you know what I mean? All that kind of stuff that you sort of get in R&B. 
I just heard these four guys just like, you know, making music together, like, you know, singing well, but not great necessarily, not like beautifully in, in all cases, uh, but belting out great music and making very catchy pop records. And I always love pop music, right? And I was just like, like, I really just started to listen to their stuff and just see how much stuff that I already liked had been influenced by them, right? And that birthed some of those songs. Like, so, and, that's, and that's the whole thing about uh, The Promised Land. When I started making that album, the songs that I was coming up with then weren't as like hard uh, as the songs that were on uh, October Sky because I was sort of moving past that and that's you know the hard element it being sort of like psychedelic alternative like fra fra fruly not like that soft right it was still okay sounding but that's probably like why Sean was like nah that's not really the vibe uh, but that was the vibe I was on so I just started um, writing those songs never put that project out um but then I started working on Lonely Hearts Club. Um, and then I decided with these new projects, I wanted to be Marco Restrepo, right? Um, because what better way, <laughs> you know, to me, it was like a Paul McCartney thing, right? I wanted to like be like that. I wanted to be Paul McCartney. Um, you know, but that's hard to do, obviously, hindsight. That's hard to do without the precedent of a Beatles, Right, you need to be a part of something before you're an individual. And obviously that's what I realize now as I'm pivoting away from Marco Restrepo. I know that I'm fucking I'm freaking crazy with like all the the rebranding. It's like people's like, Oh, you're supposed to build the brand, but you know, sometimes it just doesn't make sense. And um Marco Restrepo will always be there. But as I move towards Ever Been Blue, I realize that when you're just the solo star and you're not from the Beatles, right? If you just, your name, like a Bruno Mars or a Taylor Swift or a um, Katy Perry or a, what's the name of the um, Stay With Me guy? Just stay with me. I, don't know, I can't remember. Sam Smith. When you're that, you're, there's almost, there's this pressure to be like a pop star, right? Or to be like the Justin Bieber, right? to be the main attraction, but I'm not the main attraction, man. I sort of want to be in the context of a band, right? And that's something I always really wanted because I'm not personally the driving force of getting attention. I'm the driving force of ideas and sparking thoughts, but not of getting attention. Um, and so, um, well, anyway, so I picked Marco Restrepo. I put together the Lonely Hearts Club um, I also had an idea for an album called 1989 that was going to release after Lonely Hearts Club. But then I saw Taylor Swift, who allegedly is another INFJ. I don't know about all that. Uh, she was putting out one, too. She was putting out a 1989 album. I was like, hey, uh, she, I'm not going to let her get the 1989 idea that I already had in my head that I was ready to put out. So, um Maybe wisely, not wisely. I tried to rush that album. So I actually, that album actually ended up dropping before Lonely Hearts Club because I rushed it um, and put all those songs together. It was a 10 song album, supposed to be a bonus song. Never did the bonus song because I was rushing. And I put that out um, October 22nd, maybe. I forget when that album came out. Um, and yeah, I rushed it out there and beat her, definitely. And I, and I think there was some residual effect, but um, uh, yeah, I didn't, I didn't get the credit that I wanted. <laughs> Taylor Swift is the official 1989 spokesperson now, but that's okay. That's okay with me. Um, she's white and blonde and all that. And that's better for America anyway. Um, so yeah, I put out 1989 first, a uh, mixed bag of songs, right? Um, there's some good stuff on there. Lonely Streets, that's a fire song. And come on. Some of the, some of the things, like, I'm going to readapt a lot of these songs and put them in Ever Been Blue soon enough. Um, but, yeah, so, so I made 1989, put that under Marco. And then I made a Lonely Hearts Club, and that came out maybe a couple months later. Um, 14 songs. I picked 14 because all Beatles records had 14. And Lonely Hearts Club, obviously, 
is an allusion to um, the Beatles. But as I was saying earlier, so now at this point for 1989 Lonely Hearts Club, I had pivoted from, um, besides the Freak single, I had pivoted from program drums and used a digital drum kit. And uh, But the theme right here is that, like, like I said, I'm good at mixing hip hop records, but when it comes to mixing rock, I was completely out of my element and and also not a very good drummer. So there's a lot of, <laughs> on those albums, there's a lot of iffy drumming. There's a lot of, um, you know, sloppy bass lines. There's a lot of uh, maybe like le leveling on some of the vocals that I would have li liked to have maybe had another shot at just because I was sort of mixing, especially on uh, Never Be Famous. Um, but one day I'll get more into like the specifics of the albums. But um, I know I've been already specific. Probably like, what the hell is he talking about? So damn specific about something I didn't even ask you about. But anyway, um, so yeah, like obviously the peril of those albums is that the production quality, uh, while sounding good, like I can still listen to it now. I sort of, to me, it's almost endearing. And at the time, I felt it more strongly than I do now. But I still feel it. Like when I, if I listen to it, like I said, in a nice car with surround speakers on a computer speakers, it sounds pretty bad. Right. And you, you got to make mixes that sound good on everything. But if you listen to it in the car, it sounds all right. Right. You can sort of get lost in it, but yeah, that it, it's hard. The drums definitely meander a bit and it's definitely tempo list in a lot of parts. Um, one day, maybe I should do like a track by track breakdown and just talk about what each song means to me what it means to me um so yeah so i put that out um i got a lot of great reviews from that man like a lot of great and maybe those people was because i paid them to review me but you know some of them were bad too but it was a lot of good ones i got compared to like nick drake on one i was like wow really uh i couldn't even believe that like i still don't believe that like i don't know what i do that uh, reminded anybody of Nick Drake, but if if I can get that comparison, the comparison to one of my favorite artists of all time, I definitely took it. Um, you know that sort of, uh, you know that sort of put me here where I'm at now. October, uh, Lonely Hearts Club was my last album as of, as of yet. Um, I put out a thirty second little a thirty second uh, an album called Thirty Seconds that will be available on Spotify, um, probably whenever you hear this, especially if it's like years from now, from when I record it, um, that's out. And there's going to be more. I'm like actually going to repurpose all the rock songs from Atone the Priest and put them on a project called Atone the Priest uh, for Marco. And that'll be out uh, sometime soon as well. Um, so with all that saying, Marco has sort of become like just like a sketch pad, right? because I know a lot of the quality of the music is iffy. So I sort of stopped caring about that, right? And just used it as like, just like this thing, like this is a sketch pad of my thoughts, right? So if um, somewhere down the line, anyone's ever curious of what kind of mind a person like me has and uh, the musings and the insanities that I go through to, be, to come to my decision-making and my mental state, then this is that record. Um, so, all that to say, did I miss anything? Did I miss like the doors? I could talk about all my rock influences. Like those will all come out eventually, but uh, I fuck, I like everything, man. I like everything. So all that to say, the shift from hip hop to rock happened because I, I no longer could express myself properly on that medium and believe it. I just couldn't believe it anymore. You know, I just was not inspired anymore to come up with things to say on that medium because A, it wasn't being recepted the way I wanted it to. B, I never really thought I had like a strong hip hop voice, right? I, I remember Jordan, who I've talked about from Hot Beats, he would always say, oh, you rap, you rap like you're rock, like a rock song. You rap like you're singing on a rock song. I was like, really? I still don't hear that either, but 
he said it right so it must be true on some level so i've always sort of had that kind of thing and i th think i was always just sort of riding with what i thought i was supposed to do you know what i mean and that's also tied into what i wanted to do right because i, I was definitely wanted that the attention that came with being a rapper um and it really excited me to put words together and um come up with cool phrasings like big l man flipping words uh was one of my favorite things but another part that really disenfranchised me and i think that the biggest part of sort of just my disinterest with commercial music altogether which of rap is now the biggest form of commercial music um it was the fact that i feel like when i was coming up you would hear somebody new right or you would hear somebody really talented and skilled that no one knew about yet. And then within the year, they would start bubbling. And soon enough, they would be on the radio and they'd be on a hit song or uh, that just doesn't happen anymore, right? It's like, if you hear someone nice, there's like a 99% chance they're just gonna stay at that same level that they're already at forever, right? that they're not really going to elevate above that, you know, unless they do some really <laughs> like outlandish stuff, right. Or, or make something that's just so unforgivably pop that you're like, okay, that's not even the same anymore. But I can't even think of an example of like that. Like I just haven't since like 2009, 2008, 2009, I just have not heard an artist that intrigued me enough to want to listen to more of them because I've heard everything you had to say already. Um, the beats, you know, production has gotten a lot better in hip hop, but the beats uh, are more or less like a lot of the same things and just a lot of the same ideas recycled over and over. Like Kendrick, like, you know, I think he's a very skilled rapper, right? But I'm just not interested in hearing his story, right? Because maybe I'm just older now. And I think that the characters that they sold us, just like in wrestling, I'm a fan of wrestling, the characters they sold us in the Attitude Era, the characters they sold us in the 90s were larger than life. They were like, I won't say sophisticated, but they had depth. They had like a reasoning to them, almost like a, okay, that's them, that's not me, right? It's not a commercial yet. It's like, okay, we rap about things that we've been through and it might be enticing to you but at the same time there's a bit of caution to it right now it's just like the trap life the whole life the the gangster life it's all commercial man it's just a commercial built to entice people to think that they have it better than you besides the fact that they're millionaires right before it was like that it wasn't even about being rich yet it was about the process of getting that that you've been through so much struggle um that you needed a comeuppance and all the things that you went through to get that comeuppance were what made you interesting but now when you've already made it before anybody even knows you um which is the case for some people anyway right um if that's to assume that you bought your way into the game or something like that um then it it's just not as enticing like i said it just becomes a commercial it just becomes me wanting to be like you because you have more than me um which is a different kind of adoration it's not a mental one um and that's the that's the type of adoration i admire um a mental adoration and um luckily music is so deep that um because rock music modern rock music's not good either um it's all become commoditized to the point where people are making what they think will get them signed right and that's not everybody like i listen to wreck the georgia tech station and i hear a lot of inspiring great music um that like i said inspires me and makes me want to create but uh, anything on the commercial level is usually le level is commoditized or um, just built specifically with the intent purpose of enticing a sale. Um, 
much like when I listen to the Beach Boys, and I'm like, how did they compare the Beach Boys to the Beatles? All their songs are like commercials for for 50s, 60s, uh, USA nostalgia. It's like talking about hot dogs and driving Mustangs and taking their girlfriend to the beach and how Susie was at the fair and Susie did a lot of really goofy topics. But anyway, um, so yeah, this isn't a B-rate hip hop discussion, but just to answer the question, I, I went to rock because it's more freedom of expression. And a person like me needs all the freedom that they can get uh, to express themselves. I can't be limited to a medium that will make me be something I'm not, right? Like how Drake went from conscious rapidly rapping to emotional, uh, emotional sympathizer of women to sort of like hood gangster nigga who makes hood anthems <laughs> and not saying that he's like saying he's a gangster or anything but it's just like it's just interesting what is going on what I wanted back then what I want now and yeah man so all that to say you got to do things that make you happy and you got to grow in ways that expand your mind don't ever just think that you have to stay in one pocket because that's where everyone else is at right even if you get ostracized um you know because a lot of times i'm ostracized for those choices like i said sean didn't fuck with the music i was making uh, you know what I mean? That's my my ace, my ace. Um, but you have you have to go down that path anyway because um, you don't ever want to regret or resent what you do, right? Um, and you have to naturally grow. You have to be in a different place uh, every time that you partake in a project. You have to like come back with a new perspective, come back with a new plan for execution, come back with a new way to be great. You know what I mean? And um, don't let any genre or box uh, limit your potential because you are everything that you can be. <laughs> I don't know about the last one. That sound good coming out, but I don't know if it meant anything. But anyway, uh, thank you all for tuning in again. Um, I'll be back soon. Um, and once again, happy birthday, birthday, Easy E and Buddy Holly, two of my heroes. And uh, good night. I mean, good night. You don't know it's nighttime. Bye. Mm -hmm.